So, hello, my name is Leslie Morales. I am a humanities and communications major at California State University, Monterey Bay. I am taking um, Dr. Boras um, class. And so we were scheduling interviews um, with any one experiencing in the media. Um, and I, I saw your work and I, it amazed me. So I would love to know more about your work. Um, so feel free to share your experience in the media and like maybe how it all started and what influenced you to, um, to go into you know, communication and global communications. Yeah, well, uh, nice meeting you, Leslie, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to talk with you about my work. Um, well, uh, I don't know if you are aware, but I'm originally from Peru. So my initial work uh, is in the Andes, focusing on Andean countries, and obviously primarily Peru. Um, my trajectory into media has been a little bit uh, of uh, not a straight line. <laughs> I always wanted to make movies. I was fascinated with film and the film industry and telling stories since I was uh, a kid. But where I grew up, there was nothing like it uh, to a study. So when I finished my high school, uh, the National University in Cusco didn't have film uh, as a program. Even today, they don't have that as a program. Um, so, and, and then in Lima, in the capital of the country, there were at that time only two universities that had uh, film, film programs. And uh, now there are more, but at that time, the, I'm talking about, you know, the early 1980s. So, <laughs> so they didn't have that. And I didn't have the money to really move to the capital city and live there and go to private universities. So I decided, you know, I, I was so passionate about filmmaking and telling stories that I decided to apply for anthropology, cultural anthropology. So I studied cultural anthropology and I began training myself in uh, using uh, film cameras and sound recording and all of that. Um, and uh, in the midst of my studies in anthropology, uh, Peru was going through an internal war. Uh, this is in the 1980s to 1990s, right? And I didn't know whether or not I could continue even my studies because all national universities became like, uh, you know, battlegrounds, ideological battlegrounds, and, and, and in many cases, even with arms, because it was an arms struggle what was taking place. So I moved to the, my, uh, my older sister uh, used to live in Berkeley, California. So I moved to be with her. She said, why don't you come here and see what can you do? And so I was there for about a year and I attended UC Berkeley for a year. And, I, and, and that's when I began taking formal courses on video making and filmmaking, right? Uh, but little that I knew, you know, that I had to be like a full resident, otherwise <laughs> I was going to end up paying so much money. And I wasn't a U.S. resident at that time. So I decided, well, you know, this is extremely expensive. Um, and with what I know right now in my self-training, I could just go back and start making movies. The thing is that you have to practice. Do it, do it, do it. And that's always my recommendation for for students, right? If you really want to have these skills, uh, you have to do it, you know? And so I came back to Peru with a friend of mine and we decided to form a small, tiny film company in the city of Cusco. And that's how I started making my documentaries. But by that, I think at that time, I already had a strong understanding because of my education in cultural anthropology that I didn't want to do entertainment. I didn't want to go, you know, to Hollywood or to that, you know, that kind of environment. Uh, but I wanted to do documentaries that would record um, indigenous populations and their ways of living and their worldview. 
And also I got interested in human rights issues because of the political situation in my country. So I began uh, making documentaries and, and uh, you know, kind of just by doing it and with that one year of formal training I had. And then um, over the years, you know, by early 1990s, the situation in Peru got even worse. And, uh, but at that time I already have a strong body of work. Right? I had a, like a good sample to show to people of my work. And actually that's how it got me my US residency uh, through uh, the University of Berkeley, UC Berkeley. I went back to some people I knew there, I showed them my work and the University of Berkeley bought the rights to four of my films. And, uh, and that helped me actually to establish myself in the United States. And, uh, and then, you know, I decided, okay, I gotta go back to college and do my, a, an entire career in communications, in film and communications, right? And so by then I had a lot of experience. So college wasn't terribly bad, right? Because I already had been working. And that's why I also tell students, you know, the more you work and the more you, you create your sample reels or your, your papers, things like that, uh, they will help you along the line, right? For other studies that you may wanna do. So that's um, how I went back to school. And this time I didn't go to Berkeley because they, they didn't really have like a full production and I wanted to make movies and not study movies, right? And they do more rhetoric, more like the analysis of films. So I went to San Francisco State University in uh, San Francisco. And, uh, and I did my entire, entire formal career, my BA and my master's degree there. And then I did a, a, a PhD in communication and society. And, uh, and I decided to specialize in political economy of media and, uh, and global industries. Uh, and continue on the other hand with my practice of, of documentary filmmaking. So, I, you know, I have like two areas, right? One that is research, political economy, global media, and then another area that it's actual film production. So that's kind of, a, you know, <laughs> the overall of my trajectory. Yeah, thank you so much. I got a lot of information and thank you for the advice um, as well, because that's very important, you know. Um, yeah. Everybody has a different experience, but, you know, mm -hmm. sharing that um, really helps, you know, the framework of how to, you know, get up there <laughs> step by yeah. step. Um, so it's interesting um, how you, like all the topics you, um, you're interested, like I've always been interested in them as well, but it's really hard um, trying to balance everything now, um, whether you want to show like the truth or um, the stories of, of a community. How do you balance that? How do you make sure you share those stories and through your films and research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, as you say, it's uh, it's not easy, right? And and I think um, it helps if you are kind of an insider and that you have knowledge about the culture and and about how people may behave in certain circumstances uh, and and also historically. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you cannot do work if you are not an insider, right? You could be an outsider but be so uh, highly educated, like educate yourself, not, not of degrees, right? But not having higher degrees, but, but educate yourself about the topic that you want to do or you want to cover or the story you want to tell and talk to people, talk to experts because you are not going to be the expert in everything, but talk to experts and learn. And, and you have to learn how to distill that to tell the story you want to tell. Now, um, I think that, um, that as a documentarian and, and, and probably people as journalists, you know, you become really well-versed in different topics. 
uh, especially if you are covering different stories in different parts of the world, but always do your research, you know, and that's another advice that I would like to give to students, you know, that I always tell in my classes, being a filmmaker or being a photographer, a photojournalist um, or a video journalist doesn't mean that you don't do research or that you don't write ever, right? Because there is this idea, well, I'm just gonna do a documentary, grab my camera and go out, right? Uh, but no, you, you need to be well-versed in, in the topic that you are covering. And you need to know how people think so that you can balance out, you know, the risks that you may be taking. Uh, you can balance out uh, that you are truth, you know, you are true to what people are telling you and always double check, right? Uh, don't take at face value what people are saying, right? You always have to double check. And if you, if you do your research, you will know whether somebody is making up story or, or enhancing the story to make it more whatever, interesting or, or to be better to, to sell to people, right? Or to audiences. Um, so I, I would say the bottom line to balance this is do your research, be very, very knowledgeable about the topic, about the people you are gonna be serving. And the other thing is your ethical values, right? You have to be extremely ethical. And when there are stories that, you know, that I don't have enough knowledge or I feel like, okay, I cannot be really, you know, fair in how I'm gonna tell this story, I rather not to do it. Right, because I rather leave it until I'm, I'm sure that this is good and I'm gonna tell it in a good way um, than just do something that down the road <laughs> may cause problem to those people or to myself or to the people that I'm working with, my crew or whomever is supporting my work, right? So, and, and, and also, I mean, you have to be really ethical in how you edit anything. Right, uh, many times, you know, the stories, you, you have an interview that lasts one hour and then you will use from that hour just maybe one minute <laughs> overall, right? So you have to be very ethical in how you are editing. How are you putting it this within the context of this story so that you are not, you know, creating this imbalance of making up things uh, or having people say things that they didn't mean, right? Like they didn't mean to say this in a particular way, right? Uh, and, and when you take it out of context, it may sound in a particular way, right? So you have to be very, and, and that's not only for, for film or, or video, you know, obviously that's if you are a, a, a journalist who's writing stories and you are quoting people, you, it's the same ethical values that you need to apply. Right? And then the other, the last thing I would say, I have um, practiced what anthropologists practice, uh, cultural anthropologists, at least those of my generation, that uh, we always go back, you know, I always go back to the places where I've been filming and to the people that have granted me interviews and I show them the final work obviously before is final final you know the final work the, like the main rough cut um to get feedback and uh and if they approve that then it's final right i, I make the final cut um if if they say you know what i didn't mean this or this doesn't look good i think that's out of context or you know things have changed so much that that doesn't make sense anymore. Or I have had cases when people said, you know, uh, last year it was fine to give you the interview. Right now, if you put that out, I may be killed. So I don't want my image or what I said in your movie. So I just have to bite the bullet <laughs> and take it out or change accordingly, right? And and I think that that's part of. Um, a good practice in, in an ethical way of working with people and being respectful of their stories because ultimately you are telling their stories, right? 
so uh, just be ethical, right? Uh, and sometimes that's hard in journalism because I can do that as a documentary maker. Sometimes journalists don't go back to their sources. And in some cases, I think uh, journalists are not allowed to show to their sources the final print, let's say, right? Uh, and, and that has created, at least in the context where I work, primarily Latin America, that can create serious situations for people. And, and people have gotten killed because of that, right? So I'm very mindful of that. I, I don't wanna do that with anybody, not even with people who may be in a very safe place, you know, in Sweden, Finland, I, I don't know where they have like these high bars for journalism. If I would be working with anybody there, I would do the same practice. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, it does. I think you um, point out a lot of things that I, I have also noticed. Um, I've taken a lot. This is my senior year okay. at UB, and I've taken a lot of um, ethics and communication classes with the professors, and they reiterate what um, you notice. Um, it's the journalist world has has changed a lot, but um, but it also is like super important, but there's a lot of, you know, problems that can arise from it. Um, I know one of my professors pointed out that, you know, when people are vulnerable, is it's not a good time to take pictures, but wouldn't that capture what you're trying to get? So it's a lot of like, what are your personal ethics and like morals? Um, mm -hmm. how would you be able to balance that in your work like mm -hmm. it's definitely hard and, and challenging but the hopes is to um to promote you know mm -hmm. progress in these yeah and so yeah, yeah. And, and and for instance as, as you are talking i'm thinking of a moment uh, uh well i have had several moments but one that i always recall so vividly in where you have to balance that, you know, and, and this is in Guatemala when I was uh, filming um, Keep Your Eyes in Guatemala. I don't know if you have seen that documentary, but it's online, you can watch it. Um, and I was interviewing, uh, well, there is a cemetery in, uh, in, Guatemala, in Guatemala City where they have found like common graves where they were dumping the bodies of people that the army and the police were killing. And uh, so they, they got permission to dig out the bodies and to apply DNA testing to find bodies, right? Because it has been, this was during the war in the 1980s and, and 90s in, in Guatemala. So, you know, there are like a huge number of disappeared people. And so their families have donated their DNA in hopes of finding the remains of their, of their loved ones, right? So I was interviewing this, uh, this uh, lady who worked uh, there. She was, I think, uh, an, um, one of the archeologists of the site, right? And, um, and she was explaining to me about, we were in this room where all the, the body bags were, and it, it was thousands, right? And so she was explaining to me how they identify the bags, what kind of bones and things like that. And all of a sudden, you know, I asked her some other, like a follow-up question about how she felt because she didn't grow up in that war, but she's now working with, with the remains of that war, of that war, right? And she broke down. She began to tear up. She was talking and began to tear up and I mean, I could have exploited that. And that was, you know, a 10 second decision, right? Should I keep filming and pointing my camera at this person who's going through this emotional thing? I mean, it will look great in camera. It will be better than anything, but is that ethical for me to force her to keep talking, you know, at that moment? So I had my camera, and it was 10, 15 seconds that I immediately went through my, you know, should I do this or not? Is this okay or not? You know, all of this. And then I pulled down my camera. I stopped and pulled it down and kept talking with her. And she, you know, once I put the camera down, she really cried. 
right? She was kind of holding up a little bit. So, uh, you know, that's something, how do you balance these moments? And, and what are the ethics of exploiting emotional situations, right? In some cases, you need to show that, but in other cases, it's not really necessary. I mean, you could get 10 seconds of that. It already tells me the emotion. I don't need to keep my camera up until this person completely breaks down, right? So I think, and even if you keep the camera there, do you show that, you know, do, do you put this vulnerable person you know, on, on the movie with everything. So I think it depends on the story, obviously. You have to make those decisions, but those are decisions that you, you can make it and you should make it while you are filming or interviewing people or talking to people or recording, you know, audio recording. Uh, and if you get something like that, you, you know, you have to think what's going to be the repercussion if you put the entire thing of this person, right? So at a moment of vulnerability. And, and as a journalist, you always have to think that you have the power, right? Because you are there with a camera, with a recording. I mean, you are kind of in charge of this story, right? And so the other person is far more vulnerable than you, unless he's a politician, you know, like a president. And, then obviously things change, but uh, in terms of rank and vulnerability, but if you are doing a human story and covering a president in terms of a human story, uh, you may have, I mean, you have to be ethical no matter what. Right? Yeah, thank you so much. I really sure. appreciate that, um, that example and it's, it's hard. And, we're faced with that like almost every day. And it's just where, where, how do we make sure we continue using our ethics and our work and so on? Mm -hmm. Like it's hard, I understand completely. Um, but thank you for sharing. Um, let's see. I really, I actually um, watched your film of Rebellion Oaxaca. And I think, oh, yeah. yeah, I would like to talk about that film if that's okay. Sure. Um, so there was a lot of information that I got out of it. Um, definitely, um, you know, there was like freedom of, of the press, mm -hmm. freedom of press, uh, expression. There was, I kind of saw it as like, a, also like a feminist movement, but I'm not sure if I can categorize that. Um, but I also, um, saw like how the community came together. So mm -hmm. what made you choose? to document this and how would you, um, or what were your goals to make sure this documentation? Um. <laughs> My little dog is getting crazy. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, well, uh, it, it, that film has a very interesting story because um, I, I went to, to Oaxaca in, in Mexico uh, to just to connect with women's group, right? different women's group in CSS, which is kind of a social science center. And um, I went with uh, three, three or four of my colleagues from different areas. Uh, one was from anthropology, another one is from uh, Spanish, and the other one was, um, I believe, a sociologist, if I recall well. And, um, and the idea was to connect with these centers to get, you know, maybe a, a, some kind of agreement with my university and with the Center for, for the Study of Women in Society in, uh, at my university. But when we landed, <laughs> uh, and I ha I, I, I've heard of the teacher strike. So the teacher strike was going on. Right? But when we landed, like a day after or two days after, this massive movement of people uh, began to organize because um, they continue to, to basically, I mean, the, the police continue to harass the teachers, right? And so uh, the women of this collective movement that came, you know, 
as a coalition of different organizations and citizens in general in support of the teachers. Uh, and so the women organized this incredible march, right? This kind of a, mega, they call it mega marches uh, or, or demonstration, right? And, uh, and we happened to be there and I happened to be there with my camera. <laughs> And I decided to start filming. I went like, wow, this is fascinating. You know, and this is what, what's taking place here. It's the birth of a social movement, right? And, and usually, you know, you hear about social movements, you read about that, but to see how it begins, it's, it's uh, very interesting. And so I decided to, to start filming. And, uh, and after two, three days of filming, I decided, okay, this is a movie. So I'm gonna try to interview the different people who are involved um, and, and work with, a, with other collective, Mal de Ojo, which is on the, you know, my co kind of co-producers. I start working with them to get um, archival materials of the beginning of the strike when I was in there, right? And then, uh, and then after a year after, you know, what happened throughout the year, some things that they were recording uh, and they were really nice to share it with me. So basically I decided to do it kind of on the fly, right? Like, okay, I'm here and this is, there is a, a revolution exploding here, I get a film. And um, the women's movement, that's interesting. Uh, and I like, you know, you kind of hesitate to say a feminist movement because I don't think it's a fem it, it was a feminist uh, movement, uh, but definitely it's a women's movement. And of course, within that group, there are feminists, right? Uh, but not everybody was a feminist and wanted to do it because they were feminists. They did it as a way of supporting the teachers and also because a great majority of the women there were teachers themselves, right? So they were revealing as part of the, of the overall movement of the teachers. Um, and so basically I filmed the unfolding of that, the takeover of the, of the media. And, uh, and I got to be inside, you know, when, when they were kind of doing it and beginning to broadcast and to change all the broadcasting system and things like that. So in a way I was very fortunate <laughs> that I was at that time, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, and, and then I were, you know, I talked to many of the women who were involved, many of them leaders, and some of them were people that, uh, that we were gonna work with, right? That they are involved in different organizations. Um, so it was kind of um, out of chance, but, but uh, it turned out to be something that I committed to do it. And I filmed, you know, for months, then I went to the US, then I went back to film more. And then I went back to the US, I edit the movie and then I take it to show to, to everybody there, to most people there. And, um, and then I did the final, final cut, so. Yeah, it was a great documentary. I was very intrigued by um, by all the components of it, especially the music. I feel like you did an amazing job of um, showing the culture, um, using how they express themselves um, through that. Um, I myself am Mexican. Um, I was born in Mexico City. Mm -hmm. And so I, I definitely I love when everybody's able to see that aspect as well not just like what is going on but how are we um or how are they trying to express um you know these the feelings or um or anything else and i think that um it's really interesting and all the interviewees um were very expressive and yeah they were just amazing i was like wow like you know they had different perspectives, but they all came together um, to, you know, fight against the unjust. Um, and yeah, I really like the film. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think, I mean, it's important always to show uh, some of the culture, right? Because 
these things don't happen in a vacuum. <laughs> you know, they, they have a lot of uh, cultural background, right? And, and especially, I mean, in, in Oaxaca, I would say, you know, it's uh, obviously state in, in the city of Oaxaca where you have such an important number of um, indigenous population and, uh, and mestizos who, you know, live together and have all this mix, cultural mix that is so rich and they express it constantly, right? And so it's kind of hard to avoid it. Uh, and I think it's important to make it part of the story, right? Yeah, definitely. How long did it take you to make this film? Or how? Well, from, from beginning to end to, to the final cut, um, almost two years yeah because the 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 whole rebellion went on for over a year for a year period i was filming for about two months and then when i left they continue some things right and then i went back uh 10 months after or a year after and i did some final interviews or things like that so yeah but, you know, and then editing, because I had, I mean, it's a, it's a, what, 30 minutes? I don't remember, about 30 minutes, right? And, um, but I have like 25 hours of footage. And on top of that, I do a lot of archival uh, research, right? So Mal de Ojo allowed me to use some of their footage. And for that, I needed to go over hours and hours of footage to figure out what fits in the story right? and also what fits in the story and what is not repeating the other documentaries that other people have made because that particular movement has been covered i mean you can find tons of documentaries uh and a lot of coverage about that social movement and that teacher strike so how do you make your story uh stand alone and unique right although you are telling kind of the same story. Wow, that's a great point. I always do often, like, there's a bunch of research books and documentaries and films and all these in the archive. And it's, it is really hard, you know, like, you have to go back all the way to understand the historical context and understand, you know, how, how history should not repeat itself, but often it does. And so, um, so it's very interesting. Like, I also am having difficulties making sure that I do address new new points, and um, you know, as everything is evolving, <laughs> like you know, right mm -hmm. now we're still in the middle of a pandemic, and that's something that like yeah. Um, yeah. itself is a totally different <laughs> perspective for everybody um, yeah. that is going through it. You know. And so um, it's hard. And also, like, I also find myself um, being a bit biased when I write because I'm very passionate about, uh, you know, a certain topic. So what is uh, advice or something you would say how to not be biased um, and the work you do and like, or how, what are practices you would, um, you would share? Yeah, well, I, I mean, <clears throat> um, there is something that we have to debunk of journalism, <laughs> you know, that journalism is absolutely objective. And that's not true, right? I mean, maybe 100 years ago, you would believe that. Today, you cannot believe that journalism uh, or, you know, documentary making, which is a, it's a form of, in a way, of journalism sometimes, right? Um, that it's 100% of objective. So once you accept that, I think it's easier, right? To not embed your bias. Um, the fact that you choose to cover a particular story already is making you bias because you are drawn to something for some reason, right? Uh, so, you know, you have to acknowledge that, right? Um, and then apply your ethical practice. You know that for all stories, it has to be truth. It doesn't have to be your truth, 
you are the mediator, right? You are mediating between what has happened or the story of people and the audiences and the public. So you are the mediator and you cannot murky the waters for either side. So it's kind of an ethical personal contract that you do with yourself, right? Um, to try to avoid you know, your leanings and your bias, right? Uh, and and you, you will be able to do it, but obviously it's never 100%, right? But at, as long as you are not editing to favor, you know, what you think <laughs> and what you feel, uh, for instance, in political documentary, that's, that's something that, that it's uh, important, right? For instance, you know, um, I obviously, in the example is the documentary that, that you have to watch, uh, you know, obviously I was sympathetic to the social movement and to what was taking place there. But it wasn't hard, you know, to be sympathetic towards them because the, the police and the governor were just a disaster, right? Uh, and very oppressive. It was very clear, you know. So when it's clear like that, the film, but the film doesn't have like a, just a bias, right? I mean, it's hard to say, oh yeah, you know, this director was totally biased and supported this because, you know, the way you interview people and the way you try to represent the, the context, the historical context, how is that this happened, right? Uh, that's one way of avoiding bias because you are providing context. So whatever happens later has to be reflected in this context, right? And that will help you to not be uh, as biased as one may wanna be sometimes in some stories, right? Uh, and I think it's, uh, you know, knowing the history, doing your research, contextualizing very well the story. Uh, and then, um, you know, if it's a story where you have to give different points of view, you know, you choose people that are equally in the hierarchy of your story, they, they are equal, right? So that there is no imbalance uh, on that, or at least you try to avoid that in, imbalance. There may be some times that it's hard to avoid that, you know, but, uh, but you know, like if you have like a president of a corporation that exploits pineapples in, I don't know, in Honduras, uh, and then who's a powerful person, then you have a peasant who's making, you know, a dollar a day by working really hard in the land. How, you know, how do you juxtapose that story in a way that it's fair to everybody, but still shows the truth and the reality, or some reality, the reality that you want to shed light on. Right, because you know, people may think, well, that's not my truth, right? I mean, truth and reality are, <laughs> are points of discussion and you could have a, an entire semester just on studying what is truth and what is reality within journalism and documentary filmmaking, right? especially in documentary. Uh, but you know, you can shed light on certain realities and try to be fair. Uh, so as long as, as you do that, I think that your internal bias will be more in check, you know. Yeah. I, ho I hope that answers your question. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I it started making sense in my head. I was like, wow, like, that's so true. <laughs> like, you never really have um, double check sometimes. And, and it's important to ensure mm -hmm. that, you know, in my showing uh, like what I want people to know or am I showing what I want in people like mm -hmm. that I know you know like it, it, it's, it's hard it's hard but it definitely takes a lot of practice like you mentioned a lot of research um yeah um let's see and contextualizing things yeah yeah definitely it's difficult though, like I'm still learning and I hope to continue learning because I'm very interesting, interested well, in- Well, you, you will never stop learning. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I feel that, you know, after all these years of making documentaries and, and getting, you know, in all these uh, different types of stories, 
I always learn something and that's the beauty. That is the beauty of, of uh, journalism. That is the, the beauty of uh, documentary filmmaking, right? That every time that you embark into covering a story, you learn so much, right? And you learn from your mistakes too. You, you know, if I look back 20 years ago, I go like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. You know, I shouldn't have edited. I will re-edit these or things like that. I mean, you learn, right? So you never stop learning. That's very true. Well, thank you. Um, is there anything else you would like to share? Um, but... Well, I think, I mean, the, the, the last thing is that, um, you know, people in different parts of the world ha may have different ways of uh, filming or covering, you know, the press is different in different parts of the world. And the media systems are organized uh, somewhat differently, right? Although there are some things that are standard because there are international laws that are standard for journalism, ethics of journalism and things like that, right? That, that is a standard across the board. So, um, but, but I think that uh, for, for those of you studying in the US that may be practicing mostly in the US, I think it's important, really important, especially now with all the media and everything that we have and all the idea of fake news and all, all of that, right? That you become a serious journalist, right? Uh, somebody who is really working for the public, somebody who wants to transform society, not just make ratings and make money. Maybe that's part of it, right? But it's not the, the entire thing. I think going into communications going into especially journalism or documentary filmmaking that it's talking about social issues, uh, you have to think that you are of service to the public, right? Uh, not serving yourself with the public and the stories you tell, right? But you are serving the public, right? And that's, uh, that's something to, to keep in mind and to learn early on. Uh, so that that you do a, a really good job when you go out there to to tell stories and to cover people, especially if they are human stories, and most of them are, right? So, yeah, yeah. That's all I have to say. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Definitely, it's important to ensure that we continue that the works of many like who are, you know, trying to promote justice, trying to promote social justice in, in overall in like a different communities, not yeah. just um, a specific one. And just the interconnection and the inter, I, I forget the word, but it's like that every relation. Yeah, interrelations is like everything is connected in some mm -hmm. way or another. Um, like right now I'm looking into fast fashion um, and how like, it's it's uh like the united states is like very involved on, on that but how it affects other communities around the world like we don't really see that we don't hear it because you know like it's a lot of research that i have to do because it's not just like one point of view but it's all the points of views of how like the connection and how we can overcome that and how we can like you know help promote um more equitable and a just, um, you know, world. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, that's really, really important. And also, I mean, as you start working, even if your work only addresses, you know, let's say the Central Valley or whatever, you know, a community in Oakland, uh, still, you know, if you do it in a way that people in other parts of the world can see that, and nowadays that's easier, right? Because of YouTube and the internet and all of that. So, you know, and they could learn from that. And there may be stories that are similar, you know, the experiences of uh, farmers in Castro Valley are maybe the same experiences that peasants in the highlands of Peru, right? So how do we show that and, and make, you know, that we are more similar than different? <laughs> In, in, in that we all deserve to live in a, 
in a good environment, good uh, world, you know, that it's more just for, for everyone, right? Yeah. Well, thank you for, for your interview. I really enjoy uh, talking with you, Leslie. <laughs> I speak to you as well. Thank you so much for your time and your advice and your, um, you know, your background, your your knowledge, because it's very interesting and it's very important, um, especially for like my peers and I to, you know, to get a start. You know, we're still in our undergrad degree and we want to pursue more, you know, and make a real impact on our communities. Um, yeah, that's great. That's great. And just keep keep at it and, and, and do a good job and, and, uh, and don't be afraid to go out and start building your portfolio. That's going to be a key for for the success of all of you, you know, you and your peers. Uh, really important to keep a good portfolio and have passion, right? Just be passionate about it. And that will drive you, you know, you have to be driven by your internal Forces. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. I won't take much, much of your time anymore, but <laughs> if you have any more questions or something else comes up, feel free to email me. Um, but I had a great time talking to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.